It's been a long couple of days, but I really appreciate everybody hanging in there. Um, and every time I think a panel can't be outdone, another panel outdoes them. And I have no uh, doubt that this panel is going to live up to these expectations as well. Uh, before we get into our final panel, I want to wave this bright green evaluation form at you to remind you to please fill it out and give us your feedback uh, before you leave. Online attendees, uh, you have a form as well. Please give us your feedback. We very much appreciate it. So we're closing now with lessons from other states and other municipalities. Um, we're kind of coming full circle, again, in our, our global approach, thinking about global impacts, local impacts, regional planning, port infrastructure, fish, polar bears, oh my. So now we're going to go to some different municipalities and states to kind of add on to the lessons learned we gleaned yesterday from our Northeast case study panel. So I'm going to start with introducing our moderator for this panel. It's my good colleague and friend, uh, Julia Wyman. She's the staff attorney here at the Marine Affairs Program, and she runs our Law Fellow Program. So blatant commercial pitch. If you have an interest in utilizing any of our students as Law Fellows to provide some research for you, please check with Julia. She does a fabulous job with them. Uh, she's been with us for almost three years now. Uh, prior to that, she worked at the Coastal States Organization in Washington, D.C., where she led their climate change portfolio. She also teaches climate change and law and policy here at the law school. We're going to hear first from one of our good colleagues at the Louisiana Sea Grant Law and Policy Program, Melissa Daigle. Daigle, excuse me, it's been a long day in my my words are just not flowing very well anymore. Uh, she's been working for the Louisiana Sea Grant Law and Policy Program since 2008 and currently oversees their law student research researchers and coordinates their resiliency programs. Uh, her presentation is going to discuss the way in which two coastal parishes in Louisiana, St. Tammany and La, La Fourche? La Fouche. I'm not a Cajun, I apologize, have begun addressing the impacts of climate change. Uh, she's also going to discuss various outreach efforts completed by the Louisiana Sea Grant Law and Policy Program. Next, we're going to go to the West Coast to hear from Steve Goldbeck, the Chief Deputy, Deputy Director of the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission, BCDC. We've heard that referenced a couple times over the last couple of days. He's been there for 27 years, so a lot of experience with San Francisco, and he's going to discuss the Commission's adoption of enforceable policies for adaptation to sea level rise. We've had some questions and answers about, well, what can you do? What can you do that's enforceable? What you can do that's voluntary? So we'll get some lessons from San Francisco about that. Next, we're going to go to the, back to the Gulf Coast. We're going to hear from Tom Linton. Uh, he's currently a professor in marine sciences at Texas A&M University in Galveston. Uh, but I love when I invite speakers, and I, I, I think I know something about them, and then you read their bio, and you're really impressed. Uh, so just a few factoids about Tom. Uh, he previously served as the Commissioner of Fisheries of the State of North Carolina, helped implement some of the drafting of the Magnuson-Stevenson Act, uh, and also served as the Director of the State of North Carolina's Coastal Zone Management Program, so really quite an impressive portfolio. I stumbled upon Tom in looking for some comment commentators on the severance case, which we heard a lot about at lunchtime, um, and he's been working with a, a, a writer in Galveston, uh, drafting a, a great series of articles about the severance case. So I, I, I encourage any of you who are interested in, in, in learning a little bit more about that in a, in a very lay accessible format. Tom's articles are great. His presentation is entitled, Chronicling How a New Paradigm for Beach Management in Texas is Being Developed, and will follow on some of the great uh, presentation we heard from David Bremer today. We're going to close with Jessica Granis. Uh, she's a staff attorney and adjunct professor at the Harrison Institute for Public Law at the Georgetown University Law Center. Uh, she works with state and local governments to help them adapt to sea level rise in coordination with the Georgetown Climate Center. She's done a lot of publications, lots of, lots of presentations, a colleague of ours on many projects that we've worked together on. And she's going to present an analysis of how local governments can use land use regulation to begin to prepare for sea level rise impacts. She's going to discuss a model sea level rise ordinance that she and her students developed with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, and also potential state and federal law opportunities and barriers to local efforts to adapt, including recently passed reforms to the National Flood Insurance Program. So with that, I give you our final panel, and Melissa, please. Good afternoon, everybody. So Margaret Davidson with NOAA's Coastal Services Center has a saying that goes, today's flood is um, tomorrow's high tide. And in Louisiana, we can definitely see that happening right now. 
These images are from just a normal high tide event in Plaquemines Parish, um, which is right along the coast in South Louisiana. We're also really familiar with land loss. This image um, is from Terrebonne Parish, and you can see this is a geodetic marker, a survey marker that was installed um, just to try to maintain track of um, the land there. And this is the same area two and a half weeks later. Oh, there's the marker right there. So it, it worked really good for two and a half weeks. A lot of coastal Louisiana is already below sea level, and just because it's below sea level doesn't mean that it's underwater because of our levee system that we have. As you can see in this graphic, which might be a little bit hard to understand, Orleans Parish, as of 2010, was 54% below sea level. They're estimating that by 2050, an additional 73.2% of land will be added, land that was above sea level will end up below sea level. And then between 2050 and 2100, 85% additional land will be added from Orleans Parish um, to the area that's below sea level. And you can see in many of our coastal parishes, that's going to be a huge issue by 2100. The Sea Grant offices across um, the U.S. are engaging in a, a climate survey, and I'm helping collect the data for Louisiana. Um, in Louisiana, we contacted 257 local government officials to ask them about their views of climate, climate issues, sea level rise. Um, 43 of the surveys were completed. And so I'm going to go over just a couple of the questions to kind of give you an idea of the mindset of local government officials along our coast. So we asked them first, you know, how informed are you about the effects of a change in climate in your area? And you can see that about 75% said that they were, they were pretty informed. 46% uh, said they were moderately informed, and 25% said they were very well informed. And then when we asked them if they thought climate was changing in their area, you can see that 76% said yes, they do think that it is changing. And, and that really kind of goes against the idea that a lot of people along the coast maybe don't believe that it's changing. But when you talk to local government officials, those people who, um, who have to deal with these issues on a day-to-day -day basis and they're off record, they will say that, that they do think that, that climate is changing. So then we asked them to rate how important it is in terms of the work that they do to address climate change through adaptation, whether that's to prepare for or manage the impacts of climate change. And only 16% of those people said that it's a top priority, even though they can see the effects, they know that it's happening. Um, it's only a top, top priority for about 16%. But when you add that to people who felt that it was a medium priority, you know, there is a, a substantial amount of people who do think that, that it is important to address those impacts through their work. But then when we asked them, you know, who should initiate this local response, they were just all over the board. There's no clear majority in terms of who they feel should, should address it other than 25% um, feel that it should be some combination of government and other organizations that deal with the issue. So one of, the, one of the things that we see and that our coastal communities have to deal with is that there are gaps in hazard planning. And by hazards, we talk, we talk to them about sea level rise, we talk to them about storm surge, wind damage from storms. And the main thing is that construction standards in Louisiana allow for hazardous construction in hazardous areas. Most parishes only require that construction meet FEMA base flood elevations. I think there's only one or two areas that actually require a free board, which is that additional elevation requirement above the base flood elevation. And we know that the FEMA requirements don't include sea level rise. They don't even include subsidence, which is a huge issue in Louisiana. At Grand Isle, our um, tide gauge shows that our actual relative sea level rise rate is 9.2 millimeters a year, which is really, really high. And so for the, the um, communities to only require FEMA base flood elevations that don't include things like subsidence is just, it's very hazardous. In the um, construction regulations, there's very few scientific standards that floodplain administrators have to use to approve or deny a permit. Um, if you jump down one bullet, you can see that most of them just require this adequate drainage or you know, adequate elevation. And so that's really, really weak language in terms of when they go to actually say we're going to approve or deny a building permit. 
Very few communities have subdivision standards, even less have land use plans. We, we, don't, we don't like to do planning in South Louisiana when it comes to land use. And there's definitely a lack of penalties or very, very low penalties in most of our parishes in terms of people who decide to go against the minimum construction standards that exist. And one of the concerns that local governments have in terms of these, these hazards is seen um, in the case of SJ versus City of New Orleans from 1971. It's a Louisiana Supreme Court case. And so we have a plaintiff who owned a house in a subdivision and the City of New Orleans permitted a development that was gonna go on a vacant piece of land next to that community. And the city knew when they authorized that development that the drainage was not adequate and that the existing development would flood. They knew that going in. But the city said, well, the plaintiffs don't have a cause of action because drainage falls under the water and sewage board. And so it, you know, our allowing the development doesn't have anything to do with whether or not there's adequate drainage. Well, the Louisiana Supreme Court said, nope, that, that's, not, that's not how it's gonna work. Even though, yes, drainage falls under the sewage and water board, you, you permitted the development and they are suing you know, the city because you allowed this hazardous development um, in an area that impacted the, the plaintiff's home. And so the, the plaintiffs could, um, could get damages for the fault of the city in allowing that development to go in. We've had other cases in the state that follow the SJ case. Um, the one of most importance here at the bottom, really interesting, um, the plaintiffs sought a preliminary injunction. Um, the city of Baton Rouge had authorized a development, same situation, this, you know, the city knows that the flooding's bad and that this development only, is only gonna make it worse. And so before the, the development went in, the surrounding landowners said, wait, wait, you know, let us try to stop this ahead of time before our houses get damaged. Um, and the court said, nope, I'm sorry, we can't grant that preliminary injunction, but just remember, um, if your house is damaged, just come back and see us and we can help you then. So because of this liability issue, some communities are dealing with the issue of these hazards. And I'm actually gonna talk about three. I added one in at the last minute um, because uh, an ordinance just was passed that I wanted to mention. And so I'm gonna talk about um, St. Tammany Parish, which is right on the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain. Um, Port Fouchon, which is in Lafouche Parish and ties in beautifully with the presentation that just went before me. Um, right here in the very, very bottom of Lafouche. And then um, over in Cameron Parish, um, I'm going to talk about the Chenier Plains there. So in St. Tammany Parish, this is one of our fastest growing parishes in the state. Um, it's on the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain. There's a causeway that connects the north shore with New Orleans. So after Katrina, a lot of people moved north um, to that area. And you can see the, the boom in population between 2000 and 2010. And this parish actually has some of the most progressive development regulations in the state, which is good because even though they're on the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain, they are still very much in the coastal zone and they do suffer from pretty um, large uh, storm surge events. If Katrina's, um, they, you know, if Katrina had moved slightly to the west, they would have had much, much more flooding in that parish. And so some of these regulations, which are very progressive, um, they require permits for different clearing, grubbing, grading, displacement, or removal of dirt. Um, and the permit requirements are really strictly stated in terms of cubic feet and, and the amount of impact um, to help keep enforcement uniform throughout the parish. They have extensive drainage regulations. They have to have the drainage and paving plans stamped and certified by a licensed Louisiana State Registered Engineer for commercial, industrial, institutional, and multi multifamily developments, not subdivisions, though. And the goal is to improve this pre- and post-development runoff based on a 25-year storm event. Developers for all developments um, have to consider the impacts um, kind of long term. No subdivision and fill associated with lot development of any kind will be allowed unless it won't result in a reduction of the 100 year floodplain storage capacity. 
Now in Cameron, Cameron Parish, we have a very different situation. This is the Chenier Plain um, part of our state. And what a Chenier is, is if you look at this, this graphic at the bottom, they're kind of like speed bumps on the coastal landscape that were formed um, over many years of de uh, sand deposits and, and other sedimentary deposits that create natural ridges in the landscape. They're not very high in elevation, but when everything else around you is, is you know, no, no elevation, they, they are pretty high. Um, and so we've been working um, at Sea Grant for years to try to provide some protection to these landscapes that are naturally occurring um, and that do provide some protection. And the, up until September 2012, they didn't have any protection you know, in the coastal zone management ordinances. And this resulted in a lot of sand mining um, where the material, the, they were just being dug up. Um, as well as timber harvesting, which allows them to erode a lot faster once you remove the trees that kind of the root systems keep all the sediment in place. So in September of 2012, um, an ordinance was passed that classified these chenilles as critical landforms, and they talk about you know, unique geological features, they have critical wildlife um, that live on them, and they offer substantial protection against storm surge and flooding, especially when you think about sea level rise flooding, that'll be a little bit you know, more gradual and not you know, the big storm surge that would come through. So this ordinance prohibits, to the maximum extent practical, surface alterations that have a high adverse impact. Now the police jury, which is the governing body in the parish, does have discretion to say, no, you can go ahead and, and go forward with your activity, but the, the applicant must show an overriding reason for that activity, um, including, but not limited to, environmental remediation plans. So they do want people to engage in activities that restore the chenilles. Um, but not those such as open pit mining, large scale excavations, timber harvesting, or anything else that would severely degrade the structural integrity of these landforms. And so the last community I'm going to talk about is Port Fouchon in Lafouche Parish. We are working with Lafouche Parish on their sea level rise planning. Um, and this facility um, is, is located right on the coast. Um, and you can see all around it that it's, it's, it's right out there, that's all marsh. Um, the port services our offshore oil and gas industry. 15,000 people each month fly out of Port Fouchon to access deep water oil and gas. 270 supply vessels each day use the port facilities, and that's, that's vessels that's going to bring food or equipment or, or otherwise to those oil um, platforms and rigs. Um, 1,200 uh, trucks access the port facilities each day, it's home to, and it's home to 250 different companies. Now the port is at about six feet of elevation, um, and the surrounding wetlands are, are at about two feet, including the road that you'd use to access it. And so what the, the community did with the assistance of the state and the federal government is that they've started elevating that road. And so the road that was there, just like you saw the road in Plaquemines Parish that would flood at a high tide, was doing the same thing. And so they went in and they, they built first the Leeville Bridge, which is this part here, to, so that it could withstand 100-year storm surge impacts. And you can see over here, this is where the original road was. So you can see how low and how vulnerable that road is. The second step, the second phase of the construction was the Leeville to Port Fouchon Highway, which is this section here. So you can see Leeville is here, and this is Port Fouchon here. And so this, the two sections combined cost um, $361 million to complete, and that is 11.2 miles of roadway to access the port. There are still... Um, Let's see, uh, phase two of the, the project is going to be 8.3 miles, estimated 320 million. That part still needs to be completed. Phase three is another 19.5 miles for another 340 million. And so there are plans to extend the, the, the road further into the interior of the parish, um, but the issue is funding, funding has run out for that. But just to show, um, this is a picture, and it, it says during Hurricane Gustav, but to clarify, it was um, Hurricane Gustav hit, we had about a week in between before um, Ike passed by and caused some severe flooding, and so this was actually in between, right in between those two storms. This is the original road way here, and you can see the utility trucks that are trying to get out in time, and then you can see the elevated highway in the back. So the elevated road is working, it is above the flooded roadway, but it is very expensive. 
Um, and so now they're trying to find ways to get additional funding, including working with oil companies, because the port is mainly for the oil industry, to, to see if maybe that's a source of funding that they can use. And so I'm excited to hear any questions that y'all might have during the discussion portion. How do you get it to work? It'll do, you don't need to do it anymore. All right. If it's flashing, it's working. Otherwise, I'll just give you one. <laughs> All right. So now that I have control of the uh, clicker, good afternoon. And uh, thanks for hanging in there for our last panel. I'm going to take you on a quick tour through the work we're doing in the San Francisco Bay region to address, sea level, to address the impacts of sea level rise on San Francisco Bay. And uh, here is the Bay Region, home to 7 million plus people. And it is the largest estuary on the west coast of the Americas. And it's about a third smaller than it was at the time of the gold rush because we've been busy filling it in. This is, uh, was Yerba Buena Cove in San Francisco that uh, where all the ships came in for the gold rush. Everybody abandoned ship and they eventually filled this area in after uh, having the first brig and uh, liquor store on one of the ships. The filling continued from there. This is the 1930s World Fair and where it was held. It was also supposed to become the uh, San Francisco's airport for the Clipper planes on the Pacific, uh, but it was taken over by a military base, so San Francisco built another large airport in the bay. And this filling continued which, with everybody competing with each other to make new real estate until the end of the 1950s when the Corps of Engineers made this map of what San Francisco Bay would look like if everybody filled in all the areas susceptible to filling. And at that point, the people in the region revolted because they didn't want to live around the San Francisco Bay River. And they formed Save San Francisco Bay Association, which led to the establishment of my commission, 27-member commission that gives permits for any work in San Francisco Bay and along the shoreline with the mission of minimizing fill in the bay and maximizing public access and using the San Francisco Bay Plan which was prepared that has enforceable policies for all aspects from marinas to habitat and uh, tries to plan and provide for San Francisco Bay as a single uh, living unit. So since that time, since the mid-1960s, uh, the Commission has approved over 18 billion in uh, investments. The bay is now bigger because of mitigation required for approved fills and the public access has gone from about four miles of the shoreline to over a hundred miles. But that brings us to what we're here today. <laughs> and our agency that was established, as you heard, to address a shrinking bay now has to address a rising bay. And so uh, the Commission actually in the 1980s did a study of the impacts of sea level rise on San Francisco and this actually is data from the tide gauge at the Golden Gate which is the oldest operating tide gauge in the United States and uh, but at the time there really wasn't good estimates about what sea level rise was going to be so they just took a straight line out uh, from that and it really wasn't all that useful it didn't really have that much impact but of course the uh, modeling has gotten much better. There's much more concern about the impacts. Al Gore uh, did his inconvenient truth. And so the commission decided we needed to revisit this. And the, the, uh, our staff did a vulnerability analysis of the potential impact of sea level rise on San Francisco Bay. Identify the planning area, which is the built and the natural environment of the bay, the existing challenges it faces, like the, the historic fill, projected impacts of sea level rise, sensitivity analysis of the impacts on those systems, and lastly, the adaptive capacity, or can they take a licking and go on uh, ticking. And the scenar scenarios we use for sea level rise are, are 16 inches at 50 years, 55 inches at 100 years, the Ramsdorf semi-imperial, 
empirical numbers, I like that, semi-imperial numbers, uh, and the, the, uh, the technical work, the modeling was actually done by the U.S. Geological Survey for us. And what did we find? Uh, widespread impacts, the lighter blue is the areas that were potentially inundated at 55 inches, and that's over 280 square miles of shoreline vulnerable just at 16 inches, going up to over 330 square miles at 55 inches. And so what does that really mean? Here is uh, San Francisco airport that I flew out of, and the lighter blue shows that even at 16 inches, it's susceptible to flooding. So we always like to say this, uh, this means uh, fly Oakland. <laughs> well, no, they would be underwater as well. So not only major infrastructure, but a lot of people's houses, uh, all those things there and there, uh, would also be subject to inundation. Found that over a quarter millions of the, of the area's residents just today would be uh, potentially inundated along with the schools and everything else upon which they depend, as well as the Silicon Valley, the extreme South Bay, where uh, major corporate campuses of the internet giants, giants like Google, uh, would potentially be inundated. What happens if you tried to Google something and it just nothing came up? <laughs> they were flooded. Estimated the replacement cost, just the replacement cost for the things potentially inundated, over $60 billion. And uh, so what about the natural environment? So the bay goes back to looking like it did before we started filling it, which makes sense because we only filled it high enough to get it up out of the tidal frame. Uh, so isn't that a good thing for the bay? Well, we found that most of the bay's wetlands, as probably most of you already know, uh, really won't be able to keep up with sea level rise. So we've already lost around 80% of the bay's historic tidal wetlands. We found that there would be catastrophic impacts on the natural environment as well as the built environment. And lastly, uh, to uh, complete our dismal tale here, uh, we found that the, the impacts would come sooner than later on top of the storm surge that's already been talked about and flooding. Uh, this is out in downtown San Francisco uh, where, uh, where those clipper ships were that had brought those people back in the gold rush days. Uh, but to demonstrate this, we overlaid the areas uh, that are in the current 100-year floodplain, one chance in 100 of any years of flooding, with our 16-inch sea level rise map and found that they're same map, so Margaret's right. Today's flood is tomorrow's high tide. So, Based upon this, we did what we do. We go, went back and made changes to the San Francisco Bay Plan to have enforceable policies to address sea level rise on San Francisco Bay shoreline. We went through our process. We taught ourselves real well. We thought we knew what to do. We brought it in front of the commission, and all hell broke loose. <laughs> Local governments took one look at these inundation maps we produced and decided that what we were really trying to do was expand our jurisdiction and tell them what to do and how to do their business. The business groups were very concerned that we were discouraging investment uh, in the areas at risk and therefore we we're going to hurt the economy during a major recession and the environmental groups took one look at them and said we weren't going far enough because everybody should get out of the inundation area. So we had a lot of public discourse it was a three-year process. Uh, our Bay Plan amendments usually take like six months. Uh, and we had over 35 public hearings on this, three different iterations of the proposed policies. But what we decided to do was to take lemons and make lemonade. And we finally had everybody's attention in the region to talk about this topic when before they were far too busy. So we went around and talked to every one of the nine Bay Area counties and a lot of the local governments to talk to the local electeds about what we were doing, what the problem was, and what we proposed. And then we sat down with economic interests, the social equity representatives, and environmental groups to look at their specific concerns and actually talked about language that they would like to have in the policies, put, put aside our pride of ownership, and said, what, what will work for the region? So about a little more than a year ago, last October, the commission unanimously adopted the new policies and they were supported by the economic groups, local governments. What did they do? What do they require? First off, major projects have to provide 
a vulnerability analysis like we did for the region for their project. What's going to be the impact of sea level rise over the life of the project? And we didn't specify the exact numbers that they had to use the analysis, but it had to be uh, a credible scientific analysis with good engineering to look at the impacts. So then what do they do? We thought about this a lot, and we decided that there's actually two sea level rises that folks need to plan for. Uh, this green line here is the sea level rise when you're looking out to mid-century. It's much lower. It's things that people can respond to without heroic efforts. And uh, it's also the lines for sea level rise, these various scenarios, are all pretty tight. So we don't have to worry that somebody is way off what's actually going to occur. But when you go out to end of mid-century, those things that you did to address sea level rise down here, they're likely going to fail catastrophically. Also, this, the, num the, the various scenarios diverge, so what are we planning for here? What number do we use? That's what the engineers always say. Just tell me what number to build for, I'll do that. We can't tell them. And lastly, do we need to be making people build for something that's going to happen at the end of the century very speculatively? So what we decided to do in the policies is to require that folks build to mid-century, build the, their project to be resilient to sea level rise to mid-century, and then have an adaptive management plan to address things going forward. So for example, leave room to raise the levy on, on your project site, but don't force them to build it now. Also, they had, some of the critics had some very good points to make, one of which was, uh, our policies was dis were discouraging development in infill sites, which is a part of our mitigation strategy for greenhouse gas uh, reduction by reducing the amount of driving people have to do. And so we changed the policies to address that. So if you're going to have infill development in areas that are going to go show benefits in an area that we know we're going to protect anyway, like the Mission Bay in San Francisco, you should be able to build that project. And lastly, we realize that these are pretty much piecemeal efforts because we can only respond when people come in for permits. So we said that the regional agencies should do a uh, regional strategy to address sea level rise going forward. We have been implementing these since then. Uh, Port of Redwood City Awards was the first one through. We found that the applicants don't really have big issues. So what was the big deal? Well, part of it, of course, is that they're the climate deniers, and of course, they didn't want to do this. But really, what the pro a lot of the problem was that we went through a process and taught ourselves about this topic, became smart, and came up with a good technocratic implementation strategy, but we didn't bring along the public. And so the public didn't know why we were doing this, what the impacts were, and what our real uh, approach was. And so, of course, there was a lot of pushback. So that was on us, and we realized that you need to work with the public and you need to talk in ways that they understand and get them to understand what you're trying to do. We also, obviously, were doing it through the economic downturn uh, and uh, taking a, a very government-heavy approach, they thought, and so we tried to lighten up that and start working with folks more. And lastly, we got caught up in this fight between what I call fight or flight. So there's people who want to protect everything, pour a lot of concrete, and just go on with your business, and the other folks who say, no, we should just get out of Dodge, out of the entire inundation area. And those folks just don't agree. <laughs> but we think that you have to start, in some places, you will do one of those two things, but in other places, you've got to start living with water. And these are people in Venice, Italy, who are actually doing that today. And here's a building in Hamburg, Germany, that's built to be resilient to uh, storm surge and flooding. We realize we don't really understand how to do that. So if we're going to have this regional strategy, we need to know what the building blocks, what our design palette is. So we decided to do a pilot project where we would work with local governments in a subregion of the bay to figure out what, what you do. How, we, how would you do that? And we did a, a kind of a, a competition, who wants to work with us? And as, uh, instead of the, uh, the animosity we got before, everybody in the region wanted, they work with us, no, no, work with us. We ended up working with the East Bay because they had a lot of different uh, aspects of diverse shoreline. 
And I'm not going to go into any detail, but we went through and did a detailed uh, vulnerability assessment of the area because we can look at the, de the local conditions. And now we are working with them on coming up with adaptation planning that responds to the local region and also to the local concerns of the folks in the region. And we're working with, uh, closely with local government and also with a lot of other partners. So we're trying to be very inclusive. Uh, and instead of coming from the top down, we're working from the bottom up. And surprise, surprise, now local governments, instead of saying, what is BCDC trying to do to us, is starting to say, what can BCDC do with us and for us? And so uh, when we came out with this call for a regional strategy with regional agencies, they said, literally, you guys are just trying to throw us a hot potato. Well, now, uh, just a month ago, the regional agencies agreed that we really do need to prepare this strategy and uh, agreed to do it. And we will be, we BCDC will be working with the Association of Bay Area Governments to take the leadership on preparing a regional strategy for the region. And without, I, I'm out of time, I'll be happy to answer questions at the end. one of the buttons forward yeah, okay backward okay. and the red's your pointer forward. and I will give you a three minute All right. time. why me Lord why do I always have to follow such a good speaker why can't I get a mumbler someone who just <laughs> but anyway well uh, I uh, after hearing after I wondered why I was on this panel and maybe after I get through speaking you will all still wonder why I'm on this panel <laughs> But I've really enjoyed being here because the uh, things that I've heard here, I'm going to take home. And I've found a, a business opportunity, so to speak, from this. But uh, the import, the importance of the stuff that's been put forward in these very interesting presentations is really good stuff. And my presentation, I feel insignificant. And to make a Texan feel insignificant is quite a chore. <laughs> but uh, first of all, I want to thank Dave Brimmer for uh, setting the stage what I'm going to talk about. He uh, did that case. The people in uh, Texas and Galveston in particular are in self-denial. It is now the law. And when you have a law that you have to abide by, you need to find a way of doing that. And so Chris and I started writing this series. Uh, we call it Searching for a New Paradigm for Ma Managing the Beaches of Texas. And uh, Chris was afraid to come up here because she said, you get up there with that pack of lawyers, and it'll be like falling into an uh, awful raft with a bunch of sharks circling you. But anyway, that's her problem. But she, I called her, and I told her, we're doing pretty well. So. The Texas Gulf Coast consists of 18 coastal counties and about 250-something inland counties. And this thing shows the ones in the coast that are in our coastal management program and shows where there's erosion and uh, uh, stable lands and high, high erosion. And I mentioned, in, uh, the way I got in this many years ago uh, was a resolution by the legislature, the House, to develop a, uh, a draft of a Coastal Zone Management Act for the state of North Carolina. When I was Commissioner Fisher, who was given to my office, we did that, went around and talked to people, and then set it up, and, ran, and I was the executive director and ran it for a couple of years. But people are interested in protecting what they have, and when you start talking to folks about that and ways that it can be done, as you said. So anyway, but what we have, the problem we have here is there's about a 13 to 1 ratio of inland counties to the coastal counties. And so, let's see if I can. We've been operating under the uh, public, this public beaches or the uh, Open Beaches Act for all these many years. And we felt that it was safe and secure. But as Dave pointed out, it was a bluff 
And what he did was uh, read the fine print and to get the Supreme Court to do that too. And we have now got to come up with a new way of doing business. And so when uh, we uh, got involved in doing this, and I have some notes here which were supposed to be on the bottom of this uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation, but somehow that doesn't work. And most of the things that I do that are related to high tech uh, uh, PowerPoints and computers screw up. So I'm just going to tell you what I think was in there in the beginning. Uh, so in order to do this, and we are preparing, uh, we wrote uh, 15 articles that were printed, and uh, it's called Looking for a New Paradigm, and here's the uh, compilation of them. But we have been invited to meet with the interim House committee that is considering what they might suggest in the next session of the legislature. Uh, the writing, or my writing, has been compared to, uh, to Mark Twain. Mark Twain was a habitual liar. He died in poverty because he could not handle his finances very well. No one has made a comment about my writing as opposed to his, but those two, they say, I really uh, belong. But the Open Beaches Act, we felt protected us for all these things. Like I say, it was a bluff that they got many houses off the beach. We got a new thing to do. So <clears throat> when uh, the Supreme Court case was coming down and it looked like this was going to happen, that uh, the Open Beaches Act, uh, or the Supreme Court would say the public uh, ownership extends from the high, high water mark uh, down and the dry beach is private. Patterson, uh, Jerry Patterson, who is the commissioner of the General Land Office, canceled a $40 million beach renourishment project on the west end of Galveston Island. We were having a conference at the time about wetlands and I was standing out. This is another thing uh, I want to tell you about this conference. I have been in here and listened to my, all the presentations. Most times I find most of the presentation, many of them are too boring for me to bother with, and I'm out in the hall, you know, working the crowd and whatever. But this has been very good. There, I was out in the hall working the crowd. I was standing there with a guy from the GLO, and I saw two boats with a funny looking tube and an A frame boat in the middle going to the, to the west. And I said, what is that? So you got going there, Bob. And they said, oh, that's our $40 million project. It's going out, and they're rigging up, and they're going to pump sand on the beach, and they're going to build a beach three feet deep, and you know, on and on. And the phone rang. He said, excuse me just a minute. This is the commissioner calling. And so he took off, and he went over in the corner, and he was there and wiggling around. And when he came back, the boats had come together. And then they started turning, and they're going the other way. And I said, well, what's happening? He said, you're looking at a $40 million project that just has been canceled. So Patterson put out this thing, said the $40 million uh, sand renourishment would be stopped. Then the Supreme Court came eventually after ups and downs with state and whatever, said that the Supreme Court issued a ruling Friday that states if a majority of weather events such as a hurricane, public beach easement does not roll. We do not have, and they explained all of that. And, greater detail, but this is the kind of thing that we saw after Ike. And by the way, uh, I have a personal, uh, we, my wife and I both grew up down there, and after we retired from various places, we went back. But we bought a trailer, a, a, a mobile home sort of thing that we can drive around in. When the hurricanes come, we go uh, away. We went out just before Ike. When that hurricane, we came back and she said, I don't want to hunker down anymore. Let's sell this place. We got a place for inland. Let's do it. So we sold it. The, inter the uh, real estate market was at the peak in Galveston. <laughs> and then Ike came in. And every time I drive by that house, I say, thank you, God. <laughs> so these are the kind of things that happen. Our house is almost, it was, second, it was second row back when we bought it. It's almost first row right now. But anyway, so the, uh, the thing that we try to do with this paradigm deal was to get people together and work out a way. You, we got to find a new way of doing this. So there was a meeting between the board of directors, uh, the West Galveston Island Property Owners Association, which is all the homeowners association, and they combined there. So they met with representatives from the GLO. So Chris and I go down there, and you see our byline at the bottom. We thought, well, we'll get the information out of how this is going to work. Opening statement from the homeowners, rolling easement is not an option on the table. Okay, GLO, what do you have to say? The commissioner will only accept a rolling easement. 
And so the meeting kind of went downhill from there after that positive. Uh, so we, you know, we were trying to figure out what people want. And so we talked to him, and the guy that's the head of this uh, West property owner, we had lunch with him, and he, he, he paid, by the way. But we babbled on for an hour and a half, and the bottom line is they don't want to lose their houses. You know? And they say, we don't mind people coming on the beach, but if it's private property and we let them on there, and they have some kind of injury, they could end up suing us and own my house. We don't want that either. So figuring a way to try to get an easement so this, the beaches can be renourished. Uh, they were talking about having ordinances so people would know what it was to reduce their liability and a whole bunch of other things. We have another problem that uh, occurs during the, uh, the tourist season, and the tourist business is big in, in Galveston. Seagrass or sargasm, seaweed comes on the beach, and literally, it has come up. I've been out there on West Beach, and it's right to my hip. It's that deep, and that kind of deters the, tur the tourists because you know they come down there with the grandchildren. They're afraid they might lose a little kid, and but anyway, something <laughs> might happen. But there's all kind of stuff in there, and so state law prohibits the use of public money to improve private property without a compelling public reason, and so. Craig Brown, who is the chairman of the Parks Board, said because of the influx and the, the, the decision, the Park Board, who has, since time immemorial, been going out there and cleaning the sargasm off early in the morning before the tourists get there, they said, we ain't going to do that no more because that's private property. You guys are stuck with it. And the... Uh, the resolution of this, and I thought that I was going to be able to come in here with a great drum, drum roll because last Thursday the city council considered a static easement document which they thought was going to work and which you said Jerry Patterson was happy with and all the people out on the West End were happy with, and the thing stalled. And so it's coming up next Thursday. So you, I'm going to have to call you all next Thursday and tell you what happened. <laughs> so what we hope would happen, and this is, I love this, what uh, Chancellor Bismarck said, politics is the art of the possible, the attainable, and the next best. And so if we can find a way to get folks to work together. They came up with this uh, negotiated static easement, which is the one that has three minutes. Oh, I can finish quicker than that. Uh, <laughs> so. Perhaps the best is yet to come. This is Galveston with Ike bearing down on it. I didn't know I was supposed to have my uh, my mandatory uh, hurricane picture, but there it is. And so Galveston is right where that blue arrow points down in there. And so what we were in, they're talking about doing, and the city council, although they did not let the static easement go through, they did approve uh, the, fund, the expen expenditure of $250,000 to be matched with some other funds to investigate building what they call the Ike Dyke, which will be from uh, St. Louis Pass, which is the west end of the island over to High Island, and hopefully that will, what our problem was, we had 12 foot of uh, storm surge over the island, and went through and Bolivar, you had a picture, someone had a picture of that house on Bolivar that you get nosebleed crawling up to the top of because it's so high on the pollen, but they're trying to prevent it. Another thing that I worry about, and people on the West End worry about, are the uh, turtle, the turtles, and uh, that probably will not be such a great problem. So, in conclusion, like a soap opera, will the Galveston City Council approve the draft of the static easement next Thursday? Will General, the Land Commissioner Jerry Patterson accept the static easement? Will Texas succeed, secede from the Union as they are planning to do? <laughs> or will they remember that it was, was tried once before and it didn't work? So, <laughs> anyhow. And there are the people that contributed this. I will.
Tom, I need to cede my time to you because that was much more fun than mine's going to be. And I apologize, David, in advance. I have lots of hurricane pictures and flying houses because I last speaker of the day. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about how to use floodplain regulations to adapt to some of these impacts that we're seeing. But I first wanted to start with the obligatory um, hurricane picture. So if you look back in time and, and do the slideshow of all the obligatory fl flooding pictures from the last five years, you'll begin to see a trend in case you hadn't been paying attention for the last two days. Um, so that's all I'm going to talk about impacts because we've talked about them a lot. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about first the problem of floodplain regulations, why the existing ways that we regulate in floodplains is not sufficient given the increasing trend of, of flooding that we're seeing in our coastal communities and how we can start to build more resilience into those floodplain regulations. Oops. Um, so, can't really talk about floodplain regulations without the obligatory dig on the National Flood Insurance Program and FEMA. Um, so this is the flood insurance rate map for Shadyside in Anna Anne Arundel County in Maryland, which is close to where I'm from. Um, the blue areas indicate their 100-year flood, which is the areas of their community that has a 1% chance of flooding in any given year um, based on historical data, and that's key, historical data. Um, in those blue areas, homeowners have to build their houses to be a little bit more resilient to flooding, and if they have any kind of mortgage, they have to carry flood insurance. But if you look at Shadyside's storm surge um, model for Category 3 hurricane, that entire peninsula is inundated, in, temporarily inundated in a large storm event. And then if you also look at what's going to happen to Shadyside over the next 100 years or so, with 5 to 10 feet of sea level rise, that same peninsula is now permanently underwater. And as we move into the century, they're going to see increasingly more flood impacts. So if you go back to their flood insurance rate map, you see the problem. All that area in white, there's no requirement to hold insurance. There's no requirement to build your structures any differently. Um, and so you're going to have more and more economic impacts and losses as the future progresses. So the second part of the problem is that floodplain regulations aren't the whole puzzle. Um, in the coastal zone, you have a pretty complicated overlap between the different regulatory frameworks that apply and the different types of entities that have authority. Your local governments tend to have authority over the uplands through floodplain ordinances and zoning ordinances. But then you have state agencies that typically have some kind of regulatory authority or jurisdiction over through coastal management statutes or wetlands laws. And then you also have the feds, um, open ocean, wet beach. You get the Army Corps of Engineers involved. And this is what that looks like on the ground. This is Virginia's map of its different coastal management statutes, and you'll see that there are two local entities, two state entities, and the Army Corps of Engineers. So that means when you're thinking about adaptation, you can't think about it in the context of floodplain regulations alone. You have to think about how the policies that you want to adopt integrate with this very complicated framework for regulating coastal development. So the happy part, what's, what's the potential solution? So we worked with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Maryland's a home rule state, so local governments are predominant in terms of regulating land use. And they were really looking at how can local governments regulate development in the coastal sector differently. Um, and in Maryland, you have a variety of different communities. You have like Annapolis, looks like the community circled in red where you have very intense development. You have the Naval Academy, you have critical facilities. Most of the Anne Arundel County looks more like the orange area where you have low to medium density development. And then you have 
portions of the eastern shore that looks more like the green area where you have very low density agricultural land with sensitive natural resources and so the policies that you apply in the red area aren't necessarily going to fit the policies that you want to apply in the green area and under current ways of regulating floodplains we treat all of these areas pretty much uniformly um, so we were really looking at how can a community look at what's at risk what their topography and natural environment looks like and how can they craft a regulatory framework to respond to the diversity of lands that they're trying to to cope with these impacts so we um, developed we decided to look at the large picture adaptation strategies that you could employ protection zone build a seawall keep the floodwaters out accommodation the house on stilts approach raise things up um, the conservation zone the flying house retreat get out of there um, so the policies what does that look like in terms of the policies that you would employ in your accommodation zone that looks like the house on stilts but thinking not just what you know the base flood elevation is which is based on historic flood data but how sea level rise is going to increase those base flood elevations increasing setbacks to the extent that you can relocating things inland limiting or prohibiting critical facilities in in these um, more vulnerable areas and then moving over to the conservation zone areas where you have sensitive natural resources and you want to try to conserve the ecosystem functions that that are available there that looks like down zoning so if you have agricultural use now but there's a possibility that these lands will get subdivided and built on think about how you limit new development by down zoning and limiting subdivisions um, we employ the the Maryland the main approach of two times and you're out um, so if your house is destroyed two times in a storm event then you have to either try to move it out of the high hazard zone or um, relocate it inland to the extent that you can using natural setbacks and buffers to um, preserve and enhance the ecosystem function of the floodplain so those are the land use policies and I'm gonna skip over this cuz I don't want to talk mapping no fun um, the set next more difficult question is can you do this? Is this legal for a local government? They have to figure out not only do they have local authority to take to implement these land use policies because they're creatures of the state. They can only do exercise those powers that the state legislature has given them. The second question they have to ask is do these policies integrate with that complicated web of state coastal land use wetlands laws? Then you have overarching federal laws that local actions have to comply with. And then last but not least, you have the US Constitution and state law constitutions that protect against takings, as David talked about earlier. Um, and these are all concerns and questions that local governments have. So we did a survey of Maryland state law and also Connecticut law and identified the three kind of big barriers here was a state law coastal management program Americans with Disabilities Act and and takings challenges and here's a snapshot of what that looked like so you have your state the CAA is Maryland's coastal management plan federal is the Americans with Disabilities Act and then constitutional takings if you look at the different policies um, setbacks are per, are potentially problematic under the Critical Areas Act because it has a minimum setback requirement, so you'd have to ensure that you're complying with that state law requirement. Freeboard is potentially problematic for non-residential facilities because they have to maintain accessibility to um, persons with disabilities, so you can't just elevate everything without building ramps or elevators or somehow maintaining accessibility for those folks. But then if you look at the conservation or retreat strategies, you see some, some red exclamation points. Um, and that's because under state law, most a lot of coastal management statutes actually grandfathered in existing uses that were built before the statute went into place. And in Maryland, we found that 
there was ambiguity as to whether you could phase out those uses if they were destroyed. The statute's unclear, and it could potentially be challenging. And we've, we've talked about the takings issue. That's whenever you're severely diminishing someone's economic use of their land, you're gonna confront takings challenges. And I don't mean to say that that doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that retreat policies are not possible. It just means that perhaps a regulatory approach is not the best way to get at this particular um, end result, that regulations can support um, a retreat strategy, but they also need to be coupled with other more incentive-based approaches. Um, you could use transferable development credits or acquisitions, conservation easements, those types of strategies. Um, so that's what we looked at in terms of the local front. Now I want to turn to the overarching federal program that drives this whole process, and that's the National Flood Insurance Program. And in a rare, rare congressional spat of activity in <laughs> uh, 2012, Congress actually reauthorized the flood insurance program and amended it with some pretty significant reforms that I think will have some positive results for state and local adaptation efforts. So the first thing they did is they, FEMA used to argue that statutorily they could only map for, his, they could only use historic flood data to develop flood insurance rate maps that drive all this local regulation. Um, the new statutes give them authority to look at sea level rise on flood insurance rate maps. Um, it's my read of the statute that that's not going to affect any of the mandatory components of the program, like where floodplain regulations have to be enforced and who has to carry insurance. But it will be a tool that local governments will have so that they can see what their vulnerabilities are to sea level rise, and not just sea level rise inundation maps, which you typically see, like the bathtub model, but sea level rise run through FEMA's models slosh models to see what it does when you add s surge. Um, so I think that's going to be a useful development and we'll see what FEMA does with that new power. The second thing that it did was when the flood insurance program originally started, um, again they grandfathered in a lot of these properties and these, and these properties received highly subsidized insurance rates. Um, since the life of the program, even if they were repetitively destroyed and rebuilt. So the reforms actually phase out a lot of those subsidies, which I think is grounds for hope. And I'm going to skip my challenges slide, because who wants to talk about challenges? So my hopeful slide is I think that the stars are aligning in the in several different respects to allow local communities or encourage local communities to start thinking about adaptation and building and resilience. The first is that FEMA's in the process of rolling out new flood insurance rate maps in a lot of our coastal counties, which is going to force the, the local counties and local municipalities to, to revisit their floodplain ordinances, go through a regulatory process, and update and adopt those new maps. While they're in there, they might as well build in some extra resilience to sea level rise, I think. Um, the second thing is that with the phasing out of subsidies, we're going to see some pretty dramatic rise in insurance rates. Um, but there's a program that allows communities to counteract some of that, the economic consequences of that for homeowners in their communities called the community rating system which gives communities that implement more progressive floodplain regulation points, um, and those points directly translate to reduced insurance rates, and some of the enhanced regulatory standards that I talked about today are things that they can earn points for. So I think there'll be a drive once people get their insurance bills in the mail to um, maybe adopt some of these some of these regulatory approaches that people typically balk at. Um, so I'm done. Other shameless plugs. Um, I also put out a sea level rise um, toolkit that looks at 18 different land use tools, including some of the more incentive-based approaches that I just willy-nilly dropped out there earlier. Um, and then the Georgetown Climate Center, one of my primary partners, actually has an adaptation clearinghouse where if you're interested in adaptation, 
They have a thousand plus resources on state and local activities, federal reports, the whole nine yards. So check it out. And there's my contact information. Thanks. All right, you know the drill. We're going to go to question and answer. Uh, we'll be entertaining questions from webinar participants as well as those here live in the room. So Julia, take it away. Thank you to such a wonderful panel. What a great way to end the conference. Um, I'm going to take moderator's privilege and start with one question, and then we'll open it up so everyone starts thinking about their questions. Um, several of you touched on this, but um, to what extent We've, we've gone across the country here. Um, one of the things that we see in every state is a very developed coastline, which I think is what we find all across the United States. Um, to what extent do your policies address natural resources and habitat? And what role do you think they should play? And how do you see a successful balance of natural resources and habitat and the built environment? Are we just talking to these? Yep. Um, so in our policies, uh, we uh, did address the natural environment. We uh, had long debates about uh, requiring uh, areas for wetlands and other habitats to be able to migrate. I don't like to use the word transgress. It sounds like they're doing something wrong. Uh, but uh, we had the inevitable takings issues, uh, so we ended up encouraging folks to look at that in, in planning and in projects and to allow areas for uh, migration. And in wetland restoration projects, we have a lot of in the San Francisco Bay region, we're doing landscape scale restoration. Uh, we require that the projects start looking at sea level rise because uh, there's been a lot of critique that people are designing projects that would be, uh, disappear in 10 or 15 years. So, uh, projects need to look at sea level rise in the project planning and have an adaptive management approach to it and allow buffer areas and the like for habitat. Uh, so we're, we're looking with those, but then in our planning, uh, particularly in the adapting to rising tides in that approach, we really believe that we can't have one set of plans for the built environment and one set of plans for the natural environment. They really have to be integrated because then as we've already heard, uh, the natural resources can actually help protect the built environment. And once uh, uh, managers learn that, then they realize that wetlands are their friends. And uh, so we really think that, that it really needs, you need to take an integrated approach. Um, in Louisiana, um, if you talk about natural resources in terms of oil and gas um, <laughs> <laughs> and habitats, um, one of the things that, that really impacted our coast when, when oil and gas development first started was the, the dredging of pipeline canals. And so I don't know if you remember, but in some of the pictures you could see these really straight canals through the marshes. And as a Cajun woman told me one day, uh, God don't make nothing that straight. Um, and so those were, all, those were all dug by man. And we didn't require the companies to go back in and refill those canals after the pipelines were installed. We just recently um, passed some legislation that does require oil companies to go back in if they, if they lay a new pipeline um, to backfill those canals. And so hopefully that is a change that we're seeing. In terms of fisheries management and, and wetland migration, you know, we haven't really started talking about that in Louisiana because, and this is kind of, I guess, the sad thing about it is that as our coastline starts to break apart, and I don't really understand the science of this, but the more area that the fish have on the edges of these, these little chunks of, of grass and marshland, the better our fishery does. And so our fishery is actually doing quite well right now. And so we haven't started talking about well, what happens when, when all of that is gone and our wetlands don't have anywhere to migrate to. I guess I'm going to have to talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing that uh, I think has to be done is to make sure that the people that are developing, you have, everybody has to be in this game. And we have on the west end of Galveston some uh, sanctuaries, if you will, nature preserves. And people, a uh, number of people have uh, been involved in mitigation. And we have a new tract of land that belongs to the city of Galveston. 
640 acres on the east end that we're converting into a wetlands mitigation bank. And the, there are a lot of people that don't buy into this, but Galveston, the local folks, and the people that have come in there believe that the reason that they're there is because of the water and the fish and the birds that they like to watch and maybe the duck hunting. And they are beginning to be convinced that if we don't, if, if it's all paved over, that may not be what we have. They're also beginning to mm -hmm. realize that the water is coming up. And as I said earlier, I found a business opportunity because Chris and I are going to start another series about what global warming and sea level rise might do to Galveston. So uh, tune in for further developments. Okay. <laughs> you got to <Let's> speak. Come <laughs> on. <laughs> Jessica covered a lot of it in her talk. Um, questions? Oh. Thanks. Hi, I'm Paula Eisner. I'm a senior at Brown University and Rhode Island School of Design, and I have a question for Jessica. Um, you mentioned separate regulation um, ideas for these three different types of um, areas. And as, as I believe, these were hypothetical regulation ideas. Um, so someone could look at these separate regulation regi regimes and say that, in fact, they're an attempt to stifle growth and keep the status quo in each of these separate um, types of development. Um, and I know there's a difference between, between um, conservation and efficient growth, but how would you address these potential concerns? Steve should take this one. <laughs> um, I mean, I think the the way that Maryland has already addressed this question is through trying to shift development from low density zones to they have designations between resource conservation areas, limited growth areas, and large growth areas, and there are certain areas where they have designated those are appropriate for growth, let's drive growth into these urban metro centers, infill, um, and limit development of some of our more pristine kind of natural areas where you have you know, sensitive natural eco resources that if you lose those, you're gonna exacerbate water pollution. So there's trade-offs and, and communities are already kind of addressing with the challenges of sprawl and growth. Um, in a way that I think is is somewhat, you know, is is going in good directions, and all we need to do is start thinking about how that overlays with, you know, sea level rise vulnerabilities and climate change vulnerabilities. I have a question. Okay, <laughs> for me, yeah. not fair. Uh, yeah, who is footing the bill for this set aside land? I mean, the natural. Is that something that the developer has to do, or the public money? There's no, no substitute for ownership. Yeah, um, I mean, I, it depends on how you structure the regulation. I mean, mm -hmm. if you have existing low density development, agricultural lands, mm -hmm. that might be particular. You know, that might be a suitable use for that property where you wouldn't have to necessarily compensate them, but you would have to ensure that that land isn't converted into subdivisions and um, built out. I mean, Maryland also has one of the best transferable development credit programs in the country in Montgomery County mm -hmm. where they conserved farmland. Mm -hmm. It hasn't really been applied in a coastal context where you have very high value land, mm -hmm. um, but that's why I think if you have a regulatory regime that's designed to supplement an incentive-based approach like transferable development credits, it, it could be a, a functional a mechanism, a functional mechanism where people can transfer yeah. their right to develop somewhere else and mm -hmm. recoup their economic mm -hmm. interest in their property. Any other questions? Right over here, Tom. Yes, Thomas Rupert with Florida Sea Grant. A question for you, Tom. In the process in trying to develop this... Read that you... <laughs> <laughs> you can catch me later on that. Uh, in this whole process that's going on when in trying to develop this new paradigm, 
Has there been any talk amongst the participants about the provision of basic infrastructure and services, you know, roads, sewer, water, as because as both, of course, David and I pointed out in our presentations, those have consistently been issues in these cases. The problem is that this is so new that no one really knows the full implications of it. The homeowners out there didn't, they were dumbfounded when the park board said we we're going to stop picking up the seaweed. You know? And they were mortified when Patterson said we we're going to, going to stop uh, putting the sand on the beach. Now they're trying to get the city to put uh, garbage cans out there so that the city garbage collectors will pick it up instead of it being dumped on the beach. The ramification of this, the, the understanding of what this all means to me living on my house out there on the West End has not fully dawned on everybody. They, all of those things are yet to come. The, the, the import of this has not reached has not come home yet, <laughs> the full import. So, so, so the answer is no? Yeah, the answer is no. I don't, yeah. So I'm glad I gave you another business off. Yeah. <laughs> I guess, well, this goes, I guess, to Steve, but anybody else that wants to, to venture on this one. Uh, as you get past the adaptation strategy and you get down to the actual ground level and you start working on this stuff, one of the things that developers and other people want to know, and, and we've developed guidebooks like this in the past, what are the adaptation techniques that an agency might accept? Do you have examples or are you starting to collect those as to building ideas or concepts or those types of things that are appropriate adaptation techniques that could be used in these areas? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, the first thing we did, uh, which is what you always do if you're not quite sure how to proceed, we held an international design competition uh, <laughs> called uh, the Rising Tides Competition where we called for ideas for how you uh, adapt to uh, a rising bay. And uh, we got uh, hundreds of uh, submittals from around the world and some pretty amazing uh, uh, ideas, some of which I still have yet to quite uh, understand what they were getting at. Uh, but everything from building uh, a barrier across the Golden Gate to some of these specific techniques for how you would protect things. And uh, the, uh, the approach of the Adapting to Rising Tides project is specifically to try to get some of these ideas of how you should adapt at the local level, looking at the specific uh, kinds of assets on the ground and the things that people really care about. Because sometimes the people that we at the, for example, us at the state level think, they would care about, they say, well, that isn't really what we care about. We care about this over here. So that's what we're trying to do through that project is come up with some of those ideas. And we, we think we're really probably have to do a couple of them first so that we really get some, uh, a good palette of, of potential uh, ways to adapt. So watch this space. Mm -hmm. that's can you share those with us? Sure, yes. And you can go to the, the Adapting to Rising Tides. We have a, a a website, which I guess is adapting to rising tides, but you just Google it until they flood. <laughs> I think we have a webinar question. Is that Ooh. So, Marion Lindbergh from the Nature Conservancy. Does any panelist have a good recent example of a place where a natural feature, such as a marsh complex or enforced natural buffer, significantly reduced damage in a natural disaster? Exactly, in Galveston and Ike. That was, uh, that was documented in an article in the paper. Yes. <laughs> in Maryland as well, they did an assessment of how living shoreline features and critical area buffers survived post Isabel in comparison to hard um, armored shorelines, and they had relatively good results from that assessment. And in Louisiana, um, studies have been done that show that one mile of marshland, healthy marsh, can reduce storm surge up to three feet. And we actually got a grant from uh, US EPA uh, to do the same kind of analysis in San Francisco Bay, where we're, uh, we went in and looked at the, the topography and then uh, measured wave energy over winter storms. USGS did this with us and are, are using that to try to get some of those same kind of measurements for San Francisco. I see two questions that, uh, that hands are up. So first let's go up to Connecticut and then we'll come down to the first row. Let's 
see if we have time after that. Thanks. Uh, Diava Lambert from Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Uh, I just want to read you what I wrote down in my notes um, from each of your presentations. And I don't presume that it's completely accurate, but Louisiana ports will be gone by 2100. San Francisco Bay will be inundated by 2050. Galveston, these people are screwed already. <laughs> and Shadyside, Maryland, the firms are a joke. Um, so my question is, do you really think uh, the outlook for these areas is truly hopeful? Um, or <laughs> I'm glad you got the technical nuance. Of <laughs> I'm also from Texas, Dr. Linton. <laughs> um, so are, are, is the outlook truly hopeful, or are the current adaptation plans uh, that don't even meet uh, Katrina surge levels or 500 year storm levels, uh, just placating both stakeholders and legislators. <laughs> no, that's yours. <laughs> I'm, I'm not an elected official. <laughs> I, I think it remains to be seen. Um, we, we kind of, it's interesting because early in the debate uh, about the climate change policies, uh, everybody came in and said, well, you can't be doing this because you're, uh, you're going to hurt the economy. In fact, we had a couple of folks who called us up and said, you need to take the inundation maps off your website because you know, they're, they're, they're upsetting people. <laughs> uh, but uh, in all seriousness, we don't consider it as much of an environmental problem. It's an economic problem. So it's more what, if, what happens if we don't respond to this. We want uh, the Bay Area to be a vibrant uh, uh, region going to the end of century. We don't want it to be flooding and having those flood impacts uh, in Silicon Valley. So. We think that this is a challenge and it's going to be expensive and painful, but as other folks said, I mean, there's also going to be opportunities that are going to open up in, in doing this kind of response. So we'll have to see how it, it, it is going forward, but we, we obviously we just don't have an alternative. So. Well, I showed you this slide about the Ike Dike. If you shut down the Houston Ship Channel and you knock out the Exxon refinery at Baytown and you stop ships coming in the Houston Ship Channel, the the, the fear is that because of the, the, the fan of their importance, in only three to six days, the estimate's not all that accurate, there will be no toilet tissue on the, the shelves in Walmart in Kansas. So, but actually, it is a pretty substantial port. It is a pretty substantial producer of uh, gasoline and f jet fuels and all those kind of things. And this Ike Dike, may not be the work, but the proposition is, and this is, you know, the Dutch we're talking about, put that gate in, all you need to do is keep that storm surge at bay for three, <laughs> bad word, for about three hours because it passes by. And if you close those gates, and it's a tremendous expense, but it's about half of what the cost is estimated that occurred in Galveston and in that area from Ike, because that 12 foot of water coming across your property is not something that you want to happen too frequently. So, so we're going to go to Don, and then Dennis will get the fi final question. Thanks. Thanks, Connecticut. That was a beautiful setup. Steve, you, <laughs> <laughs> you, you partially answered my question. How do you make all the good? You, you guys have dispensed all kinds of fabulous solutions, engineers, scientists, and uh, planners. But how do you sell them? How do you sugarcoat that stuff for the politicians so it's not so daunting, not so uh, draconian, not so, um, uh, what do you call it, threatening? Yeah. Thank so, you. So um, in Louisiana, at least, anything that, almost anything a community can do to prepare for sea level rise is something that they would also do to pre prepare for storm surge. And communities in coastal Louisiana love to prepare for storm surge. <laughs> so we, we really sell it to them that way, that, that you know, you can tell people you're doing it because it, it'll help their house withstand a hurricane. And, and in the back of your mind, you know that it'll also help them um, deal with the changes of sea level rise. And also, uh, the, uh, the 
the Rising Tides competition really showed me something because uh, I've gone around and given variations on this presentation and it is pretty dispiriting for a lot of the audiences. But when we did the, uh, put up the boards for the uh, adapting to Rising Tides and we watched people walk through as the ferry building, um, this big public space in San Francisco and people, it just drew people like a magnet and they were really interested and they're talking and they're all excited and they weren't, they weren't going away depressed and, and down-spirited, in part because instead of just taking a we're a hosed approach, uh, <laughs> they put it in a more, you know, almost, almost like a popular science or here's what we can do to address this. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I guess it sounds kind of trite, but Americans love this can do. We've got a problem, we're going to solve it. <clears throat> and so it, that's how you have to approach it. You know, we have this problem and here's the, here are the tools and here are the methods to to try to, to solve this. And the, and the other aspect, of course, is, uh, as I try to get across in my talk, is working with the local communities, working with the business community, working with the social justice communities. Because uh, cooperatively, you can get a, a long way. But if you just try to come in and hit them with the, the hammer, uh, you're not going to get very far. Well, and I mean, I, one of the persons that I love to watch speak is Tim Troutman in uh, Mecklenburg County, North Carolina. Um, they did, they've done some fabulous work in terms of using FEMA mitigation money after s storm events to buy out repetitively flooded parts of their community and they're trying to get funding to do an economic study of what the costs recouped from those projects were because they have dramatically reduced their um, emergency response costs in these areas and they created all these open space parks that have somewhat rejuvenated the, the neighboring properties. So they're, they're anecdotally rough back of the napkin sketch numbers, thinking that they're recouping the costs incurred to buy out these properties within 10 or 12 years, which you know, from a capital investment standpoint is a pretty quick recover. Um, so I think, and th that's how they've been selling the win-wins uh, of some of these mitigation strategies and I think at a federal level you're going to see some movement. I mean after Sandy, FEMA is already 18 billion dollars in the hole. They have a 21 billion dollar cap in terms of what they can um, take out in debt. Claims from Sandy are I would assume going to far <laughs> outseed, uh, exceed that cap so they're going to have to go to Congress early in the next term when we're hitting the national debt limit again um, and ask Congress for another uh, re-up on their, their um, authorization to borrow to pay out claims. So I think maybe we'll see another kind of engagement on this uh, subsidizing insurance question and whether or not we can continue down this road. What we did in North, what I did in North Carolina when we were working on the coastal zone thing, I gave talks in in Wake Forest, in Charlotte, and all up through the Piedmont, because those people have a vote and they're interested in the coast. And in one of the articles that we wrote, I contacted the editor of the Mule Shoe Journal, which is the new newspaper in Mule Shoe, Texas, which probably many of you read or subscribe to. And I called him <laughs> and I said, uh, what are you writing in the paper about the severance case? And he said, do what? And I said, uh, I'd like to send you these. So we're going to start running some articles about this in the Mule Shoe Journal and in the Texas, uh, the, uh, the Texas Magazine. So get out and sell it. The thing that I have, that has hung with me in all of this, we got all this information. There needs to be a champion out there. I'll carry somebody to carry the ball. And there needs to be a lot of information passed through popular things, and you need to get those old duffers that meet down at the cafe on every morning and drink coffee and solve the problems of the world and start talking about this and say, we gotta do something about this before it takes away our grandchildren. What I, we don't want our grandchildren to say it's grandpa's fault. To <laughs> stay, and that's, it's gotta get, be got out there to the public and it has to be gotten to them. So we're going to go to Dennis, and then we're going to go to Sunshine, and then we'll be done. The uh, optimism versus uh, pessimism, uh, and, and some of the very good comments you, you made from Connecticut. Uh, I, I'd like to put this in a little bit of context, and Tom, um, Galveston 
as you know, is the place where uh, more human lives were lost in one storm event in 1906, I believe it was. Uh, about 6,000 people? 7,000, 1,900. 7,000. Um, and we're doing better than that today because we do understand more about storm events. We are adapting. Uh, we are, where necessary, retreating. And if any country in the world can afford to retreat, it's the United States. You know, we've been, we've been talking about how sad it is that folks in New Jersey still don't have power. Well, half the world doesn't have power uh, every night. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> so I think uh, long term, there is cause for optimism, um, much more so in the United States than, say, in, in, in Bangladesh or in Vanuatu uh, or Tuvalu, countries that will likely disappear with sea level rise. W we do have land to retreat to. It's going to be a, a different looking place, but we have both the uh, smarts and the resources to make intelligent decisions. So rather than uh, leaving with an, oh my God, things are desperate. Um, I'm leaving with the perspective that if there's any place on the planet that has a chance to figure this out and demonstrate some, some leadership, it's here. And the, the thinking that we heard over the last two days, uh, I think is really uh, astounding that uh, we have advanced this far in, in the national debate over what to do in the aftermath of, of, of a Sandy. As we look at the combination of storm events and sea level rise, is we just have to think differently. But we, with the creative energy in this room, I'm much more optimistic after these two days than, than pessimistic. A new paradigm, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for taking this. Um, so my name is Sunshine Menezes. I run a program called the Metcalf Institute at the URI's Graduate School of Oceanography around the corner. And I wanted to respond to something Dr. Linton just said. Uh, the, what we do at Metcalf Institute is train journalists to better report on science and the environment. And I'm actually preparing a program to be held in the next two weeks that is going to focus on adaptation in southern New England and, and why this is newsworthy. And so Dr. Linton's point about the mule shoe paper and the fact that you are talking to someone there and encouraging them to do this story is one that I would just like to drive home with everyone in, in this room. Um, reaching out to local... local um, journalists is a really critical step in this process and it doesn't just have to be the New York Times folks you know I mean it's okay and in fact really useful to get these conversations moving at the local level because people still subscribe to their local newspapers so I would just like to um, underscore that and thanks for making the point and thanks to everybody this was great please join me in thanking our panel I invite the panelists to all resume their seats, and uh, I'm going to truncate what was allocated for a half hour of, of, of discussion time because we're running a little behind schedule, and I'm, we're committed to letting us all out on time. And I'm going to take organizers' privilege. Hello? There we are. Poor Joe doesn't know where I am. Um, I'm going to take organizers' privilege here and uh, just try to sum up a few threads, if I might. Um, First off, I feel incredibly grateful to have had all of the great minds and presentations here, not only up here at the podium behind the table, but all, also without the, the audience. Um, the energy of these events always varies. You never know. It's like throwing a dinner party. You know, you think some people might get along. You think they might not. You make your seating chart for your wedding, and you just you got to keep the crazy uncle away from his ex-wife, and you just you never know. Um, and the chemistry of this event was uh, remarkable. So I give all of you great credit. Um, I learned a lot. Uh, I've learned a lot in organizing this conference. And I vary widely from despair to optimism on any given day. Uh, I have a seven-year-old daughter, and I'm thinking hard about her future. And I'm thinking hard about inland property. Um, I did learn that I am, I am the alarmed. Uh, I'm middle-aged. I bought a Prius last year. <laughs> I think this is a problem, and I've spent a year pulling together a conference to talk about it. So that was that was that was sort of sobering to see how uh, Jeff Feinberg had me nailed. Um, but I want to return back to what we were just talking about. Well, so what next? And political leadership, and media outreach, and communication, and you know how how does this get on the radar? Uh, so there's a lot behind political will and leadership. Um, and the fascinating thing about this topic is it isn't at one level. 
And again, I'll apologize again and use my disclaimer that I know we didn't do full service to any one of our topics. We did not get the full range of views and opinions on any one topic. We totally abandoned international issues and inundation issues because we just couldn't squeeze it into two days. Um, but we did hear a lot, and I hope what comes through to you is that the decisions that we're going to be confronting are at multiple levels. It's going to be your neighborhood. It's going to be your town. It's going to be a county or it's going to be a county far, far away where Google is, or in New York, which can't function and affects your life in other ways. Um, and so this is really transports into a lot of different decision-making levels. Um, I think another takeaway I took from today and yesterday was how interdisciplinary this is. I mean, I knew that when I put it together. It wasn't an accident that I inserted some really great scientists into the discussion to help inform what we're thinking about. But thinking back to some of the governance issues that, uh, that Robin raised so, so well in her presentation, and other presenters as well, we're still operating with various silos and various forms of government that we all know aren't adaptive to the problems that they're facing. I'm not sure government is ever really well adapted to the problems they're facing, but when we're looking at the pace of change and the scope of problems that we're facing with climate change impacts on the coast, that really sort of sticks out. It is what it is, but I think that just is informative also. Um, and I would throw out a challenge to each one of you who's, uh, who's been pursuing this program in the last couple of days. Um, who's going to do it? Where's the leadership? Well. I'm looking at you. You've all got a lot of information. Uh, you've got a great contact list of fellow attendees and of great speakers. You're all going back to different parts of your community um, and your different communities and stakeholders. Uh, you can think about how to engage in this in whatever way seems to work for you. I think uh, another word that I like that has come up um, in a few presentations, especially as we've been getting near the end, is vulnerability. I think when you start to talk to people about adaptation and climate change and greenhouse gas, that it sort of it sort of goes over the heads of a lot of folks that aren't aren't policy wonks like I am. Vulnerability gets your attention. Am I vulnerable? Is New York vulnerable? Is Providence vulnerable? Galveston? Well, yeah. And if we're vulnerable, then maybe we should think about what are some strategies to address how vulnerable and at least make some informed decisions whether or not they're they're smart decisions or stupid decisions. So I think uh, incorporating that concept a bit into our, into our messaging on this may be helpful. Uh, I think also I heard a lot about the different tools that are available, and it's sort, of, it's sort of staggering to actually think about that, but I think it's important. We have scientific information. There are legal tools. There are incentive tools. Uh, there, are, there are contests um, where you have houses in the air in, in a ferry terminal. There's lots of ways uh, and tools to get at this, and I think we're really going to need to think creatively of how to avail ourselves of tools as managers, as citizens, in confronting some of these challenges. Uh, I, I, I hate to be crass, but I think a lot of this is going to come down to money, because at so many levels, whether it's local or FEMA and bazillion dollars that you can't even wrap your head about it, I think as a society, we're going to have to start questioning um, how long are we going to continue to throw good money after bad when we have infrastructure, communities, lives that are increasingly vulnerable. Um, I hope we start making some prudent decisions before that vulnerability and that financial tipping point turns the coast into the Dust Bowl, the new Dust Bowl. Uh, I don't know that we will. People are not always that uh, proactive in our decision making. But again, I turn to all of you. You have a whole lot of information now to participate in those discussions. Finally, I, I really think, um, you know, our, our future of our coast is at stake. Um, I don't think of myself that, as that old, but it is, it is staggering to me to think that where I live now in Rhode Island is now already sort of in that New Jersey climate. That's happened in, in my lifetime. Um, there's not going to be codfish around much longer. That's happened in my lifetime. Uh, these are real issues. Um, there's some sadness there. There's going to be changes. There's going to be winners and losers. It's just going to be different. But I really, again, putting this conference together has just been a tremendous eye-opener for me about how much our way of life on our coasts um, is at risk, and it's going to change. So. 
I don't have anything more profound to say to you if any of that was profound. Uh, but again, I want to thank all of you for coming and for participating. We will have the web, uh, excuse me, the PowerPoints available online. Uh, probably within a day or two. We'll have the video of each panel and keynote speaker available probably in a few days once we recover and do some editing. Um, so thank you all. Coming. If this is on, as part of this start of change, um, during one of the breaks, I was on uh, the phone talking with our, one of our senators, Senator Reed's staff about FEMA uh, and some issues that we're having with floodplain mapping. If you have a horror story uh, or a, uh, an issue with FEMA's floodplain mapping, uh, Senator Reed would, and his staff would like to hear about it because I'm often viewed as a, a living, breathing hemorrhoid, I think, at times. Um, <laughs> but as they said, if it's beyond me and it's other States that are having an issue, they are coming to the conclusion that now they, they need to have another look at how this gets done. So if you have examples and you can forward them in to me, please, I'd, I'd love to see it because uh, the senator would certainly like to know about it. So 